hear that uh, in articles or or any other mob show for that uh, for that kind of reason. Nobody ever seems to like really mention that, but that was sort of the ruling that we went with. Anybody, like I said, made prior to 1962 could do whatever they fucking wanted to, but made after 1962, you're going to be killed. Uh, and what makes that ruling interesting, at least in terms of Paul Castellano and his reign, is that uh, Gerlando Shasha, uh, you know, in the Cherry Hill Gambinos were pushing weight and were breaking that very rule. Uh, par- apparently, Paul Castellano's rule only was accepted and applied when he felt like using it to his advantage. And that was one of the knocks against Paul Castellano. So Paul Castellano had forged a deal with the Westies, uh, which was beneficial in the sense of turf, uh, territories, kickbacks, and et cetera. And at the same time, he could use them as sort of as a personal hit team. Uh, Same thing he kind of did with the Cherry Hill Gambinos. Uh, Putting borderline serial killer Roy DeMeo in charge of them was probably about as poor of a decision as it gets. Uh, DeMeo uh, essentially allowed the Westies to to do whatever they wanted to, to free wheel. Uh, Roy DeMeo was a big part of the Gambino crime family. Uh, any trepidation that Paul Castellano uh, didn't want Roy around was probably smoothed over by Nino Gaggi. Uh, Castellano did under- didn't really understand the bloodlust that DeMeo was fond of. He just didn't understand how anybody could enjoy killing like Paul, uh, like uh, Roy did. Uh, that that was the reason why. Uh, when Nino would go to Paul repeatedly saying, you know, let's get Roy DeMeo made, that's why Castellano wouldn't do it. It had nothing to do with trust, just the fact that this guy's a fucking nut. He kills everybody. I don't want that guy in the family. Uh, But after a ton of prodding, you know, obviously we know that Paul Castellano would relent on that decision. And in in many cases, uh, he sealed his own fate by doing that. Uh, Whereas DeMeo was an incredible earner in every sense and every aspect of his life, uh, the seedier side of Roy DeMeo uh, the, the idea that he ignored all of the rules uh, and his willingness to kill women uh, and pretty much anybody without permission would come back to haunt uh, the hunchback on the hill. Uh, while Paul Castellano would make some decisions that ultimately would seal his own fate down the line, it truly was Angelo Ruggiero's mouth that gave the federal government everything that they would need to connect Paul Castellano to drugs, to murders, uh, then through other informants like Willie Boy Johnson and, and et cetera, uh, that would lead them to DeMeo, which would then lead DeMeo to the Kuwait car operation, the grisly unsanctioned murders, then to the Westies, and any murder committed by the Gambinos after the fact. Uh, with few decisions, Castellano really sort of wrecked what could have been an interesting reign, uh, and his respectability by not being careful and making ill-advised decisions really fucked him up. Uh, oftentimes, people blame this and that on other people. But like I said, and I've always said, while Castellano walked into some issues, he also created a lot of issues for himself. Uh, so when we look at the totality of what Paul Castellano did, uh, the, the the good, the bad, and the ugly, um, we, we, we start to learn, or we at least we, we start to lean sort of in a direction uh, that maybe perhaps John Gotti had some sort of correct thinking, albeit, you know, he had a very personal axe to grind. Maybe Gotti was put in a position where he really had no other alternative, uh, and Gotti didn't begin that way. Uh, and so today we're, we're going to lay the groundwork or the pathway for what will ultimately lead us to Castellano's downfall. Granted, uh, you know, most of that is going to be talked about today, but the eventuality of all of his mistakes are not going to come to fruition until obviously next week. Uh, so Roy DeMail, uh, I want to jump back to 1975 for a minute. I wanted to establish Roy, at least from the perspective of what he was doing and, and sort of where he was heading. And so in late 1975, Roy gets involved in, in porn distribution. Uh, obviously, by poaching into what Richard Kuklinski was doing at the time, uh, he would further that into being a silent holder of peep shows and prostitution rackets in New Jersey, and he would take those over after the owner got deep in with him, uh, owing debts related to loan sharking. Uh, then Roy does something that I haven't often admitted on this show and I haven't really talked about because I find it fucking disgusting. Uh, and what that was was Roy began dealing in child pornography. Uh, 
Uh, that is true. Uh, and like I said, a lot of people over the years have brought that up to me. And, and I just I find it to be such a vile and fucking disgusting thing that I just kind of always bypassed it. Uh, but facts are facts. That's what he was doing. Uh, and he was moving child porn from New Jersey to New York City to Philadelphia and even to Rhode Island. And what ends up happening is Nino Gaji finds out that Roy's doing it and he demands him to stop. Uh, not just, you know, first of all, it's vile. It's revolting. Who the fuck wants to be involved in any of that? And he basically tells Roy, you're either going to stop or I'm going to have you killed. That's the bottom line. And Roy just kind of pays it no mind. And he just pretty much keeps selling pornography. Uh, Roy would then move into the narcotics trafficking business, which was a huge fucking no-no. Uh, he was importing pot from Colombia and moving big amounts of cocaine at the Gemini Lounge. So we can see that DeMeo really wasn't one to do what he was told. The rules kind of applied only to whoever else, but not him. Uh, I think if Castellano had known any of that, uh, I don't think that Paul Castellano ever would have made him. And I think that he would probably killed Roy DeMeo a hell of a lot sooner than he actually did. Uh, in 1976, the IRS sort of begins looking into Roy DeMeo's finances and his taxes. Uh, at the time, he was relatively unknown to law enforcement, but the second that he took over the Brooklyn Credit Union and began divvying out loans to mob friends, knowing they weren't going to pay them back, essentially uh, sort of wrecked the bank. And that's when the feds sort of began looking at him because they were getting complaints from customers. Uh, and they began to watch DeMeo really closely. Uh, DeMeo, for the most part, would be slick, and he ends up designing false affidavits to get underneath the IRS peeking uh, into everything that was going on, and it, it sort of killed anything the feds were trying to do or the IRS was trying to do. And it's also around this time that he begins to move into the auto theft business. Uh, DeMeo would buy team auto wholesalers and would use Matty Rega, who owned a car dealership in Jersey, and Matty Rega would move stolen cars on his uh, lot in Jersey. Uh, prior to all of that, uh, DeMeo was never on track to be made. Uh, he was merely an associate of Nino, and uh, at the time, Nino Gaggi was not even a captain. He was just a soldier. Uh, so when Carlo Gambino dies, uh, and I'm simply just showing you how this all connects. Uh, when Carlo Gambino dies and Paul takes over, Nino ends up becoming a captain in the crime family, which afforded DeMeo a lot of wiggle room. Uh, it enabled him to move into different rackets, with having the protection of Nino being overhead of him. Uh, it also made Roy close to a leader within the Gambino crime family, which would sort of lay the groundwork uh, for him to be made if that's what he so chose to, to do, and that's what he wanted. And it also meant that Nino could find a way to sort of get it into Paul's head that, listen, this guy makes us a lot of money. He's willing to kill for the family. Uh, you know, and, and I think that, you know, I, I think that when Castellano repeatedly refused to make Roy DeMeo, I think Roy DeMeo was smart enough to understand that at some point the books were going to open again, uh, and he needed to, to sort of make himself look more acceptable in the eyes of Paul Castellano. And as we said last week, his involvement in bringing the Westies into the fold with Castellano is the thing that ends up getting him his button. Uh, weird thing to get him made, but that's essentially what it was. Uh, in 1979, was a big year for Roy DeMeo. Uh, he would go full swing into auto theft. Uh, his crew would, you know, we've talked about this before on the DeMeo shows, but uh, his crew would steal cars, reprint the VINs, and they would end up shipping them to Kuwait uh, and Puerto Rico via, via the port in New Jersey. They were, they were stealing hundreds of cars a week, uh, and the crew was netting $30,000 a piece from that racket. The problem with the racket, though, was that they were stealing way too many cars. Record complaints were going into the NYPD, and they started to look around. And then on the back end of that, Roy DeMeo started killing anybody he considered a threat. While DeMeo, while the DeMeo crew itself was willing to, to do contracted hits, they pretty much just completely lost their shit and just started killing anything and everything or anyone who posed a problem for them. And it's estimated they killed between 70 and 200 people in a, uh, just a, just a six-year span. Uh, 1980, the warehouse in New Jersey where DeMeo was storing his cars got hit by the feds. Uh, the feds had pretty much been watching the warehouse and had been keeping a close look on the men who were working the docks, loading the cars in the containers. The two that were responsible for that was Freddie DeNome and Henry, Dirty Henry Borelli. Uh, a search warrant was executed and both were arrested and the feds knew that the two were in business with DeMeo. Uh, the problem was there wasn't enough information that could get them a conviction or to indict DeMeo. 
And what DeMeo does is he demands that Freddie Denome and Dirty Henry plead guilty to those charges to avoid leading the feds to his door. And that is the beginning of the end for Roy DeMeo. 1982 uh, would begin one hell of an ascent. Uh, let's just be honest about it. By 1982, uh, the feds were all over top of Roy DeMeo. They were looking into a huge amount of people who were either missing or were last seen at the Gemini Lounge or anybody who was doing business with Roy DeMeo. There was like 40 or 50 people the police were looking into. And that's an insane amount of fucking people. Uh, it's also the same year that Angelo Ruggiero moves to his new house and the feds end up tapping every single fucking room in that house. Uh, it was from those wiretaps that they picked up a conversation between John Gotti, Gene Gotti, and Angelo Ruggiero. They were discussing Roy DeMeo and the fact that Paul Castellano wanted him dead, but couldn't find anybody who wanted to get involved, which wasn't a slight, you know, out of fear. A lot of people say, oh, God, he was afraid to kill him. And I, that's not what it was. It was the sheer amount of fucking heat that Roy DeMeo had on him. They knew he was being tailed. And anybody that would go after Roy DeMeo at that point, it just... A fool's errand. You're going to get caught. And then that's the reason why Gotti wanted absolutely nothing to do with it. Uh, Gotti was actually offered the job, uh, but he just he just wasn't going to get involved in that. And I think that that was a smart move. Uh, this is the same wiretap where, uh, you know, where they discussed John Gotti's murder hits. Uh, a lot of people, especially specific rat, is saying he never killed anybody, and that's not fucking true. Uh, on this particular wiretap uh john Gotti does discuss where he admits killing 10 people and sort of in comparison sort of makes a mockery he says jesus christ you know demeo's killed 37 that we know about never mind the people we don't uh frankie de chico was eventually asked to handle the roy demeo hit but he could never find uh a location of where roy demeo was because at the time roy pretty much goes into hiding uh you know demeo had been by all accounts, sloppy. Uh, not only did he create his own problems, but all roads were leading back to him. And with the Ruggiero bug, it would just be a matter of time before the feds would have enough on DeMeo to make an arrest. Uh, there were also rumors that a grand jury was underway to indict Paul Castellano. So on Castellano's behalf, uh, he knew that everything Roy had been up to was likely going to come back to haunt him. Uh, not only was Roy dangerous, but everything Roy did and would be tied to Castellano just because of the conspiracy theory, not conspiracy theories, but it's a conspiracy, right? So if you have Paul Castellano, any any money that's made illegally, if that could be traced back to Castellano, albeit drugs or murder, Paul Castellano is going to take the hit too. Uh, but what Paul Castellano does not realize at the time is that Angelo Ruggiero was burying Paul Castellano with his own mouth. Uh, Castellano demanded that Roy DeMeo be killed and immediately uh, ordered that hit to Nino Gaggi uh, to either take care of this or he would be next. Uh, and so Nino Gaggi doesn't have a choice. Uh, whatever he felt about Roy didn't really matter. He had no choice but to do as he was told. So Roy, you know, uh, was being looked for at the time. He was being sent for. Uh, and he was pretty much what I like to call cloak and dagger in it. Uh, he knew his life was coming to an abrupt end. It was just about how much longer can I survive? And ultimately, uh, you know, DeMeo could have taken off. He could have left the country, but he didn't. He showed up at a meeting where he knew he was going to be killed and he was shot and killed by his own men. Uh, Nino, Anthony Center, and Joey Testa finished the job. Uh, what has been re misreported for a long time is that Roy DeMeo had a tape deck installed in his trunk, which led to rumors that Roy was an informant. Uh, I can tell you is that the tape deck system was placed in the trunk by Anthony and Joey, and that was put in there in an effort to throw off the police as to what the reason might be for the, Roy, the murder of Roy DeMeo. Uh, but the FBI already knew uh, that DeMeo was a dead man walking from the tapes that were procured from Angelo Ruggiero's home. And so... They, they automatically knew that DeMeo was likely going to be killed just from those, those wiretaps alone. And, and so Anthony Center and them decided to try to throw off the FBI uh, and confuse them. So as 1983 comes, things are just going to get absolutely fucking worse. The FBI would plan a bug in Paul Castellano's house. Not only did they have Ruggiero bugged, but they had the murder of Roy DeMeo to solve. Uh, the bug would be placed in Castellano's house, but they truly, at the end of the day, acquired more information from the Ruggiero bug than they did from the Castellano bug. Castellano uh, was weary of the, the, the DeMeo hit, 
but he was more worried about the grand jury meeting and was worried about just about everybody and anybody who was doing dumb shit. It made Castellano paranoid and for some good reasons. Uh, so the bugs were installed and the feds began to listen. Uh, while Castellano had, you know, his own issues, uh, he was still, you know, maintaining wanting money lots and lots of it. Uh, not only was money pouring in from the traditional rackets, uh, but he had a lot of money coming in from the concrete club, which we talked about before. Uh, and the problem that they were having was other crime families were getting caught on wiretaps discussing Castellano and his greedy ways. Uh, Tony Dux Corallo was caught disgusting, discussing Paul Castellano with Sal Avellino, where Avellino was pretty much, you know, he was disgruntled over Castellano's pure fucking greed. Um and basically on this wiretap, um, you know, listen, Castellano had more of his lion's share of money. Uh, and he ends up griping with Avellino over a $200,000 payment, which Gambino, or excuse me, Castellano was getting two hundred grand a month from a union racket. Well, one particular month, it was $25,000 short. And apparently he was very frustrated by it. And he called that a fucking bone. Uh, Tony Ducks Corallo is is absolutely irate in this wiretap saying a bonus two hundred fucking thousand dollars you fucking serious imagine that he can't get enough i don't understand him for the fucking hell of me he didn't get enough imagine that he didn't get enough fucking money so as we can see other crime families were noticing that castellano who should have been focused on incoming problems was more focused on the bottom line which was money and you know that speaks volumes uh so so when Castellano becomes boss, he sort of hands over the reins to Neil Delacroix to run the day-to-day -day operations. I, I don't think that he took into consideration that Delacroix, excuse me, Delacroix would have more to say uh, with the younger, more brash mobsters on the streets. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, <coughs> guys on the streets looked up to, to Delacroix because he was like them. He came up from the gutters. He came up from nothing. And I think that Delacroix just, when he spoke, people listened. Uh, and I don't think Paul Castellano got that same sort of respect. Um, Carlo Gambino had always feared uh, younger generations of the mafia because he felt like they didn't understand Cosa Nostra at its core. And he always, was always afraid of them, always weary of them. Uh, Castellano sort of had the same thinking. Um, but with him, it was out of sight, out of mind, not my problem. I'll let Neil Delacroix uh, deal with that. Uh, so while the Bergen Hunt Club, which is where John Gotti and Jeannie Gotti and Angelo Ruggiero and, and Delacroix were, even though they had disdain for Castellano, what they didn't know at the time, a lot, this is a million different things happening at once, but they didn't know that the, their own club had been bugged. Uh, not only that, but Willie Boy Johnson had been spilling information to the feds for some time, and that would continue. And as we get closer to Gotti's reign, we're going to talk more about that because from day one, they almost sort of, they're looking at, you know, Angelo Ruggiero, but now they're going to start looking at John Gotti. And now they got Willie Boy Johnson who's starting to provide things. And, and basically, you're going to see how this works out. But had the Queen's DA and the FBI been sort of in tune, John Gotti goes away almost immediately in, in the early days, uh, you know, before Paul Castellano uh, gets shot. But because they butted heads, you know, there were other things that sort of uh, happy uh, happen. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the FBI, like I said, and the Queens District Attorneys were at odds. Uh, Johnson was almost Johnson was almost outed as a rat before he really even began. Uh, Willie Boy Johnson ends up getting caught selling drugs near JFK Airport to Arnold Squitteri, uh, who was a drug dealer. Uh, detectives didn't know that Johnson was a rat, and they end up following him home, and they see him unloading money from his trunk, and they pretty much get out of the car, and they approach him, and he explains that he has a gambling operation, and this was money from that. Not a bright thing to say, but I think Johnson thought uh, that they knew, or at least maybe they suspected he was already talking to the feds, and he was stunned when they end up arresting him on the spot. Uh, Johnson ends up panicking, and he offers them the entirety of the holdings, which was $50,000. They then threaten to charge him with bribery. Uh, and he says, listen, you know, I got information you might want to have, you know, this, that, and the third. Uh, but the, the, the fear 
wasn't really the fact that Willie Boy Johnson would give these detectives information. The fear is, is because the minute he was arrested, it, it's going to be publicly noted. Uh, not to mention he was on parole. And, and like I said, those memos of him being arrested are going to hit the streets. And if he ends up just walking out, then it's going to create suspicion of him being an informant. And so it all gets worked out. Uh, and now Johnson was talking not only to the feds, but to the Queens district attorneys and the FBI, like I said, uh, which would lead to the bug being installed at the Bergen Club. Uh, at the same time, uh, the FBI and Queens DA would bump heads as both were launching separate uh, investigations, and the FBI launched a search warrant for the club based on rumors of illegal fireworks. So in other words, they had no no really solid evidence or information to get in the club, so they used the bullshit of the illegal fireworks to get themselves into the door. Uh, and the problem is with that... Uh, is that, uh, you know, it, listen, it, it enabled them to, to walk in and plant bugs, but it almost destroyed what the Queen's DA at the time was attempting to do. The problem was uh, the Gambinos had cops within the system who alerted them to wiretaps, and so any attempt by either side to sort of wiretap that club uh, failed on every single level. Uh, the FBI at the time had offices in Rigo Park, uh, and, and often the, you know, after work, the agents would go to local bars and they would end up discussing business. In July of 1982, one of Bruce Mao's agents had gone to a local bar after work and had hung out in his possession, uh, which was a case file. In that case file uh, contained the affidavit for surveillance on Angelo Ruggiero's house. It contained in-depth files as to what the feds were up to. It was the roadmap as to what they were doing and how they were going to acquire information. Basically, everything they were doing was right there. It was as de it was detailed as to who Ruggiero was around, who he was talking to, what crimes they thought he was up to, uh, and there were various reports of who was being wiretapped and why. And somehow, that file ends up getting left at a bar, and somehow it gets into the hands of An uh, Anthony Muscatello, uh, who was an associate of John Gotti. From there, it landed in the hands of Angelo Ruggiero. Ruggiero, at that point, knows for certain. He was skeptical and he thought they were following him, but now he knows he's fucked. Um, and you think that getting a file like that would have stopped you dead in your tracks and you'd start shutting up, but it didn't. Uh, but it did help him avoid certain trappings. Uh, and the FBI who were surveilling him began to notice he was doing things a little bit differently, uh, which led them to believe wrongly that Ruggiero had a source within in the department who tipped them off. Uh, the worst case for the FBI uh, was that in this was in the folder. That is the worst fucking thing that could happen to them. Uh, it also contained information about a close informant who was giving them information which enabled the FBI to bug Ruggiero's house. So now Ruggiero knows what they're looking for, who they're looking for, but now he knows there's a fucking informant. Uh, and listen, I'm going to tell you something from a street perspective. Uh, when somebody starts telling and the cops and the feds start reporting shit or saying they know this, they know that, you can pretty much ascertain very quickly who the fuck was giving up that information. Uh, throughout the, the file that Ruggiero gets his hands on, he finds out that that he was not the only person they were looking at. They were looking at Robert DiBernardo, Angelo Ruggiero, obviously Jeannie Gotti, John Carneglia, Eddie Wino were also being targeted, which led him back to the fucking, oh my God, they're looking at the drug dealing. Uh, so imagine what Angelo Ruggiero, when he gets this file, is, is feeling like. Uh, he knows he's being watched. He knows it's been going on for a long time. He knows they've got wiretaps out the ass, but now he can confirm that for two years they've been listening. And now he realizes likely that many of the things that he might have said, could have said, are now in the hands of the FBI. And uh, they were only able to acquire those wiretaps because of an informant. Uh, Ruggiero immediately would sort of trace back in his mind to March of 1982 uh, when his wife had told him that, that they were having problems with his phone and phone workers were you know, going to come to the house and he was okay with that, they end up coming in the house to fix connection errors and et cetera. And the explanation that the feds, because they were undercover feds, gave to the Ruggiero's was that, oh, there's some kind of power surge going on between the houses. We just got to you know, figure this out. And Ruggiero immediately suspected that they were feds uh, and he ends up making calls. 
and he finds out that they are in fact federal agents and that's one of the reasons why angelo ruggiero moved out of his house the first time uh he should have felt unsafe then uh but he didn't and later on continued to talk even more openly on the phone and and for the life of me i don't understand at that point why you just don't shut the fuck up but he didn't april 17th of 1982 ruggiero is absolutely paranoid at this point uh he ends up <clears throat> calling a friend uh, who had the technology to detect wiretap uh, sort of devices. Uh, and the feds were fully aware that Angelo Ruggiero was going to do this because they're listening. And so rather than go into the house and remove the wiretaps, they just remotely turn them off so that when this guy comes in and he sweeps for electronic bugs, it comes up, you know, fucking empty. And because Angelo Ruggiero trusted this guy so fucking much, he gave the guy to the Lucchese's and everybody else not realizing that the feds just simply turned off the bugs. And the minute the guy leaves, they turn him back on. Uh, so he felt safe for some fucking reason. Uh, at the same time that this is going on, Paul Castellano issues sort of an edict. He didn't want anybody moving drugs. Uh, and he didn't really want anybody doing anything stupid because he felt that it could add more charges to his already ongoing grand jury hearing. Uh, and he just didn't want any more charges. And he ends up telling Neil Della Croce, make sure your people are not moving junk. Uh, Angelo was repeatedly asked by Neil Della Croce, are you involved in drugs? Are you dealing drugs? And every single time he lied and said no. Word ends up traveling back to Cast excuse me, Castellano that Ruggiero was selling a lot of fucking drugs. And again, Paul inquired and Della Croce would ask Ruggiero and Ruggiero would say, nope, I'm not doing it. Ruggiero feared that the tapes in any form uh, would come back to haunt him and he begins to get more and more and more paranoid uh the feds are listening uh and they the whole time they never stopped and they knew ver via angelo ruggiero's mouth that paul castellano was the boss of the gambino crime family they could always assume it they could always suspect it but now angelo has just given them that information uh they had ruggiero talking shit about castellano talking about drugs uh, and with Willie Boy Johnson providing information, they now had enough to connect Castellano to drugs, to connect Castellano to Ruggiero, which allowed them to get the bug in Paul Castellano's house. That's the information that allowed them to do this. Uh, without Ruggiero's mouth, they'd probably never get enough on Big Paul uh, to do that. But the bug would uh, be installed in Paul Castellano's house. Yes, we've all heard the stories about how they fed the dogs drugs and that's how they get in the house. I don't want to go through all that, but that bug would last from, I believe, 82 to 83 when it en ended up malfunctioning on its own. So as 1982 comes to a close, Ruggiero was pretty much a walking train wreck of paranoia. Uh, the feds were all over him and he knew it. The other pending issue was with Alan Dallantash. Uh, Dallantash... Uh, was a longtime business partner of his brother, Sal Ruggiero. He was the one who helped Ruggiero move around the money, and he was the one who helped Ruggiero uh, and everybody else search Sal's house uh, that night that he died looking for drugs and money and, and information that could lead to Ruggiero and anybody else. Uh, so Dow and Tash ends up going to visit Angelo Ruggiero. They step outside, and Ruggiero immediately complains that he's under a ton of heat and and Dow and Tash reports that before his brother Sal died he'd given him one and a half kilos of heroin uh why Dow and Tash didn't tell Ruggiero for day one really isn't that strange to me it just sounds like he was gonna claim it and sell it for himself but he claims that he didn't know what was in the case handed to him by his brother at the time but now he's finally figured out he also explains that they found envelopes which contained heroin uh, they ended up hiding the heroin in Westchester County and had been offered $450,000 for it, but they were holding out. Uh, they wanted a partial payment. Uh, so it's apparent uh, that they sort of had a deal in place. And I don't know how much was truly discussed with, with, with Angelo Ruggiero at the time, uh, but the deal was established that uh, there was a deal before Ruggiero's death to deal with this. And because he died, it sort of got on hold. But the deal was for 50 kilos of cocaine, and the sellers agreed to take $120,000 in collateral, and they would hover, hold over about a kilo of heroin. And then once the direct full payment was made, the heroin would, heroin would come back the other direction. Uh, Angelo explained to him that he wants Dow and Tash to take care of it immediately. 
big fucking mistake. Uh, so Dallin Tash and his partner Devaney uh, would head to Louisiana to handle the deal. Uh, they handed over the deposit and the goods. The problem is they were immediately arrested by an undercover cop. Technically, they were state state, state police uh, who were posing as drug traffickers and buyers. The feds had picked up grumbling of what was going on down in Louisiana, and they stepped in to help Dowentash and Devaney uh, because they, they suspected, and rightly so, that Angelo Ruggiero was involved. Uh, they were told that if they helped uh, at sentencing, they would get a break. So that April, Dowentash entered into an agreement with the Brooklyn Organized Crime Strike Task Force, and he agrees to work with the specialized unit of Louisiana as well. Dow and Tash then t- took the feds to a secret location where he had been hiding the stash of heroin that Angelo had been looking for all along that belonged to his brother. Uh, the feds knew that they could count on Dow and, T- excuse me, Dow and Tash to give them the goods on Ruggiero. He could provide details of meetings that took place within Ruggiero's house. Uh, and remember, at the same time the, in existence from the beginning, the feds were watching who was going in and out of Angelo's house. So all he was doing was validating what they already had on film anyway. Uh, Dow and Tash could give them who was there, where they were sitting about, what they talked about, who ran this, who ran that. Uh, and then they, the, the most important part of this is that through the wiretaps, they could attach names to voices. Uh, and that is a big, big fucking uh, problem. Uh, and so uh, Dow and Tash uh, and Devaney end up going to work for the feds. And the feds begin uh, really using him to their advantage, along with hundreds of hours of tapes of Angelo talking. Uh, the feds end up drafting an indictment, which would include Ruggiero, Jeannie Gotti, John Carniglia, Anthony Moscatello, uh, Gerlando Shasha, who we know is a Canadian drug dealer, John Carniglia, Anthony Mos- uh, I said, uh, yeah, Anthony Moscatello, we said him, Eddie Lino, Michael Coro, and Michael Coro was a lawyer. He was a bad lawyer. He was a guy that covered up a lot of shit for them. Uh, Joe Gagliano, Oscar uh, Ansorian, Sal Scala, Mark Ryder, who at one time had been banned by John Gotti for selling drugs, uh, but somehow Ryder still got involved with Angelo Ruggiero. He was a noted drug dealer. Uh, Will Sestaro, uh, but the only person not indicted was John Gotti. Uh, word begins to travel that an indictment was coming for Ruggiero. Everybody essentially braced for it. On August 23rd of 1983, Angelo Ruggiero, Michael Coro, Gene Gotti, John Carniglia, uh, Joe Gagliano, Anthony uh, Muscatello, and Mark Ryder, uh, Sal Scala, Scala were arrested in pre-dawn raids. Uh, agents attempted to arrest uh, Gerlando Shasha, who had taken off back to California, Canada, Eddie Lino, uh, Oscar and Sorian, Sal Greco, and William Sestaro were all missing and considered uh, to be FBI fugitives. And, and a lot of people have said over the years that they thought that they were tipped off. So as reports of the arrests sort of hit the street, Castellano is going fucking nuts. Uh, he realized that not only did the DeMeo shit cripple him, but he worried about that mess but now we had to worry about the fact that Della Croce had not been minding the store and had pretty much given uh, the Bergen crew way too much slack. Castellano knew he had major issues because the reports leaking proved that a massive amount of drugs were being sold by the Bergen crew and that if the feds could prove that he got any that, – that if he took any money for Ruggiero that came as a result of drugs, it was done. He was done. Uh, he was, he was going to be completely fucked. Uh, for John Gotti – uh, who was not indicted in any of this, uh, the issue was going to be a problem too uh, because he was going to be held accountable for allowing it, uh, for knowing about it, and for not doing anything about it. Uh, Paul was caught on wiretaps saying that Gotti knew that they were doing that and he didn't do anything to stop it and he could not control his own fucking crew. He was irate. Gotti ends up getting summoned to Paul Castellano's house to talk about the issue. Uh, so Gotti would go to Paul Castellano's house, uh, and they sat down in the kitchen, and verbatim, uh, Castellano tells Gotti that he wants proof that he didn't know that Angelo Ruggiero was selling junk. He wanted proof that John Gotti didn't know that Jeannie Gotti wasn't involved in it. He wanted proof 
that Gotti had no clue what was going on. And he explains to John Gotti that day, I want copies of those fucking tapes and that Ruggiero's life was at stake. And if John Gotti was not going to comply, he was going to be demoted. The crew would be broken up. And if that didn't work, he would kill John Gotti. Gotti ends up going back to Neil Delacroach, explains what happened at the meeting. And Delacroach assures John Gotti, I'll talk to Paul. I'll settle him down. It's going to buy us enough time before the tapes or portion of them are even released to the lawyers. So we have time to cool the waters. Don't worry about it. As more information of the case begins to seep out, Castellano gets more and more demanding of Neil Delacroach. So at the same time, uh, the indictment that Paul Castellano had been worried about was coming. On March 30th of 1984, the feds arrest Paul Castellano. He was arrested and indicted for a slew of crimes. Uh, the federal grand jury would end up indicting Castellano and 20 other Gambino members and associates on charges of drug trafficking, murder, theft, prostitution, which led right back to the DeMeo crew. And it also doesn't help that Dominic Montiglio had end up, ended up becoming a rat and was providing information to the feds about Castellano, Nino Gaggi, and others. Castellano would demand the tapes from Angelo Ruggiero again because he needed those to prepare himself for his own trial. And those tapes actually might help Castellano. And Delacroach ends up stalling. He continues to stall. Uh, he explained that Ruggiero, you know, Delacroach ends up telling Paul Castellano, look, you know, he's worried. He said maybe some embarrassing things. And Paul didn't give a fuck. Uh, what Paul didn't know then, uh, which he would find out on his own, was that Angelo Ruggiero had buried him the mafia, other bosses, other families. And Castellano, with his own mouth, buried himself in many ways, but the damage had been done by Angelo Ruggiero specifically. And just as Castellano suspected, Ruggiero was 100% complicit in the majority of the problems that he was going to have. Now, granted, we can make an argument of, of Roy DeMeo in this nonsense, but if Angelo Ruggiero doesn't make the connection between Roy DeMeo and, and fucking... Uh, uh, make the connection between Castellano and DeMeo and if John Gotti doesn't make the connection of, of them or Jeannie Gotti then, then they may not ever be able to prove that but once again it's everything is coming back to hot Paul Castellano but the majority of this is because of Angelo Ruggiero uh, you know Della Croach who, who could have been rightfully held accountable uh, for a crew he was supposedly overseeing uh, kept stalling uh, he ends up defending Gotti. He defends Ruggiero, but he does that behind the scenes. He does not do that to Paul Castellano. He does it with his own men. Uh, I have copies of wiretaps, which I'm going to read here in a second, uh, and they're verbatim. Uh, so he explains on these wiretaps to Ruggiero that all he's trying to do is force a delay with Castellano. Uh, and he says, what the fuck am I supposed to do? Tell a guy to go fuck himself over them tapes? Stop bringing it up? If I do that, we go to war. You understand? You understand me? Uh, and Della Croach is starting to, to sort of feel like Angelo Ruggiero is being, sol he's being a selfish prick about it. You're worried about yourself. What about all these other people? Uh, it's not just about you because the whole entire crew is in danger. John Gotti's in danger. Neil Della Croach is in danger. Angelo's in danger. They're all in danger. And Della Croach reminds Ruggiero um, which is also caught on wiretaps. And this is verbatim. I ain't saying you're wrong. Don't consider yourself. You've got a lot of other fellas too that you like. A lot of other fellas are going to get hurt too. Not only you could get hurt, I could get hurt. He could get hurt. There's a lot of other fellas who could get hurt. For what? For what? Because you don't want to show them them fucking tapes? So while Castellano was concerned with Angelo's mouth, he has to worry about his own fate because he finds out the feds have wiretapped his house too. Never mind the fucking rats. They had their own mouths to fucking blame. So next week, we come back on the Gambino Crime Family Part 6. We're going to reach a pivotal point and a pivotal portion of the Gambino Crime Family. Not only is Castellano facing two indictments, or excuse me, one indictment, but a second one is coming. Rogerio continues to hand over those tapes. And the Bergen crew is beginning to wonder if Castellano is going to move on them. 
Everyone is paranoid. Everyone is angry. And it's all going to reach a boiling point, and you guys know where this is going. Uh, I'm trying to be in-depth as, as I possibly can so that we all understand the moving parts of the machine that is the Gambino crime family. And I think today you realize that maybe perhaps the mistrust of Della Croach was for a good reason. Because we've always talked about on this show how Carlo Gambino didn't fully trust Della Croach because of the Anastasia thing. And that Paul Castellano kind of carried over to him. The mistake that Castellano makes is that he trusts Neil Della Croach. And as you're seeing, Neil Della Croach is sitting in the back saying, you know, it is what it is. He's trying to save the life of John Gotti. He's trying to save the life of Jeannie Gotti. He's trying to save the life of Angelo Ruggiero. But he's being pressed nonstop. And the pure fact is, is those tapes really don't matter because in a very short fashion, Paul Castellano is going to find out what's on those tapes to begin with. But by the time he does that, it's way too fucking late. And if he's going to follow any of his intuition from that day when he first says to fucking Della Croach, I want these fucking tapes. The minute he wasn't handed the tapes in the first three or four weeks, he should have started killing people. Could have saved himself a lot of fucking grief. And so, yeah, where Angelo Ruggiero is responsible for a lot of this, Paul Castellano also got talking himself. So next week when we come back, uh, we're going to get into part six of the Gambino crime family, which is going to lead to shots being fired in Manhattan. So all that being said, I wanted to thank everybody for listening to the show. We're going to get out of here, and we will be back next week for part six of the Gambino crime family history.